Larry Fessenden is an indie film legend, and he's here to talk about his new film, Blackout. Larry, welcome to the show. How's it going, man? Hey, Chris. Great to see you, man. I love all the graphics on Film Threat. You guys just keep on keeping on. <laughs> Well, I like I was telling you before we started, we're nearly professional at this stage. Yeah, so. that's right. Yeah. Just yeah. practice makes perfect. Practice makes perfect. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like like I mean, your career has been so amazing in the sense that you like make these indie movies, you're you're in them, you you direct them, you're kind of all over. Uh, you first came to my attention with habit. Uh, yeah. Can you talk about the beginnings of your indie film career before we talk about your new film Blackout? Yeah, well, actually, I had made a movie called No Telling, which was about animal rights and environmentalism. So it was not a good movie to start with. Uh, it was <laughs> fairly unpopular. It cost more than habit. And uh, I learned a lot about working with crews and uh, what maybe not to do. Um, and then uh, I was so sad uh, with the whole experience that I worked for someone else, Kelly Reichert, and I helped her make a first film. Uh, and then that inspired me to just do it my way uh, and with as small a group of people as possible. So I made Habit for about 60K um, on film and with about six crew members. And it was a great experience. I was in it. So I was doing everything and I really enjoyed that process. And in a weird way, despite uh, flirting with Hollywood many times, uh, I, I like this model of, of working. Uh, it sort of reminds me of Herzog when I uh, first encountered uh, Werner Herzog and his madness and all of that was very inspiring to me. And he's a very tactile filmmaker and that's what I tried to do with Habit. Now I didn't do that well either, so I self-distributed and that's where I sort of learned literally the soup to nuts of filmmaking, which is to say, yeah, you're not done till it's out in the theaters and in the hands of the fans. So uh, that was a long journey, but it was worth it. And I learned about uh, distribution and I'm still, you know, I'm being distributed by Dark Sky Films now. But the uh, truth is, is, you know, when you're an indie filmmaker, you're going to be part of that promotional aspect as well. So it's the whole deal. And Dark Sky puts out good stuff. They seem to curate a lot of really amazing work. But it's interesting because in your career, you've sort of had one foot in you you've done big mainstream stuff mm -hmm. um even in spine of night you did a vo an animation yeah. voice remember we talked about that you did a voice for that bizarre <laughs> heavy metal inspired animated cartoon and you're I also the prophet of doom <laughs> <laughs> oh my god oh i love i love that such That's a cool movie most weird animated films and you're even in a buddy of mine's film uh phil's Lutterinsky, bob odenkirk a girlfriend's day. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Yeah, that was a great experience. Uh, Odin Kirk was so nice. He, you know, what he does? He gives books to uh, uh, his comrades, the people that work on the picture, and he, uh, that was just so gracious and cool. Uh, he somehow knew my movies. I guess he'd seen Wendigo on, you know, late night TV or something. So he was really generous, and we actually uh, kept up a couple of years later. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that was a great experience. But I want to ask about the contrast between working on, you know, some, you know, big Hollywood production as opposed to the indie um, advantages, disadvantages. What do you prefer and what have you learned? Well, look, the irony is that even on a big movie, like I was in a film with Jodie Foster um, and, uh, you know, you, there are trailers everywhere. It was a New York shoot and, you know, they take over the block and everything. So in that regard, it's huge and it's intimidating. But then when you get in the room with the camera and the other actor, it doesn't matter if they're Jodie Foster. Uh, suddenly you're just doing the work. So there's something there's a great camaraderie to uh, being a, a filmmaker, uh, being an artist, an uh, actor, you know, with someone else, uh, the, the stature diminishes. You're all in there to get the scene right. Um, I mean, I haven't worked with mean directors or terrible directors. That's a whole other, maybe that's a big problem, but I'll, everybody I've worked, I, I've really enjoyed. I did work with Scorsese, not once, but twice. So I, I've seen, you know, the highest of the high and he's just incredible, but it, there again, he creates an intimacy. Uh, my own taste, I think, is that I like the, the the indie space. I just like working where it's very tactile and you can touch the props and there's a little less formality to things. Um, but I, I never disparage Hollywood. There are a lot of incredible people, especially in the crew, you know, meaning the art departments and, and all of that. And uh, it, it is an honor. I have interacted with them. I almost made a movie called The Orphanage with Guillermo del Toro uh, at the 
you know, as a producer. And, and it was great meeting the artisans who would have been my collaborators until they got rid of me. <laughs> but uh, what, so. What is it about the intimacy of doing an indie film where you've got, like, like you said, uh, with Habit, a crew of six people? Like, yeah. are there things you learn from Hollywood that you apply to indie? And I'm curious because a lot of the people who watch our interviews are aspiring indie filmmakers. So are there any lessons or things you'd like to pass along? Well, the reality is that it's a great privilege to make a small film because you really are more responsible for everything. Um, uh, but at the same time, like with any collaborative medium, you are dependent on your collaborators to raise the, raise the bar. As far as the ultimate reality, it's, um, I mean, look, some people really fetishize tools, and I do agree. Like, sometimes you want a crane shot. But but I try to produce movies and even my own work. If the crane is the idea, then, you know, you're going to pay for it. And you're just going to have your – you're going to use your budget wisely to create what I always say are the girders, you know, the tentpole things that you want in the movie. You have a werewolf, you got to get the makeup right. So you are – designating what little funds you have to get something so what i'm getting at is it has to do with what's in the frame that's all that matters in the movie so you you know it's funny a lot of the money is back there with all the trailers and the nice little doodads and the fucking craft service but what's in front of the camera is what matters and in in a way an indie film that's made smartly you have the same choices what lens are you going to use is this a long shot a you know a single a one or are you going to get in there for coverage so i try not to it seems almost self-pitying to complain about your budget. You, those are your, those are the structure. That's the stricture, stricture, structure. Those are the restrictions. <laughs> the structure is your restriction. Um, so uh, that's just, uh, as I said, you can't be uh, sweating how you wish you had more money. Now, sometimes you do wish you had more time, and you know, you got to figure it out. Maybe you can raise a couple more bucks, or I don't know. I'm lucky. I work quickly. That's how I work. You know, I love the. Uh, Marty and, and Woody Allen, you know, the comparison, like Woody Allen couldn't make a two hour movie, let alone a three and a half hour movie. He just doesn't have the, it's not in his metabolism as an artist. He makes a 78 minute movie, you know, throughout his career, but he makes a lot of them. So uh, I just think I'm a guy that likes to be light on my feet and uh, solving problems like a punk rock song, as opposed to, you know, uh, uh, making an orchestra, which is a magnificent thing to do, but maybe not what I'm cut out for. <laughs> Well, I think indie film just by its very nature, you know, when you've got a, a you know, lower budgets, it's just, it's punk rock from the start. So, yeah, because just having spoken to so many filmmakers over the course of doing film threat, Hollywood tends to solve all problems with money. Absolutely. And indie film, you have to solve it creatively without money. And yeah. are there creative decisions you can point to that you've done where, you know, it was, we didn't have money, so we did this. Um, I, I just, I, I love that indie film spirit and always just admire filmmakers that solve problems with creativity rather than just spending more money because they can. Yeah, I agree. And uh, I mean, I think of in my werewolf movie, and I don't want to credit this with the money, but it's it's worth mentioning that, you know, I, I have him transforming when he's talking about the first time he transforms. Uh, I do it with animation, uh, not in some cutesy way, but because the character is a painter. So he sort of imagines the world through paintings. And so you have the seminal moment of a werewolf film is done in this whole other uh, way. But I'd like to believe it's absolutely integral. So it's conceivable that I could have gotten Rick Baker if I had the money and, you know, I <laughs> had a two, four minute transformation scene. But I'm very happy with what I've done because it's uh, it's part of the DNA of the movie is that he's a painter and therefore the animation. Now, that took seven months and 250 individual beautiful paintings by this maniac friend of mine, James <laughs> Seward. So, you know, it required a different kind of uh, negotiation. Like I had to sort of book his time and, and you know seduce him with promises of helping him with a movie or something in the future. And uh, so there was a creative solution, but it was also served the movie precisely the, the way I would have wanted it. Your career is very much rooted in that. We're going to get to blackout later for sure, but your sure. career is rooted pretty firmly in horror and genre. What is it that attracts you? to those types of films. I mean, I, I, I'm a fan. I love those movies. 
Yeah. Where, where do you know? Is it you're a fan of them? Do you have people influence you? What what attracts you to horror? Uh, it's just the way I'm wired. It's as simple as that. You wake up in the when you're a kid and you're like, oh wow, that is so cool. And even when I was little, I like sharks. I love great white sharks long before Peter Benchley got out of bed in the morning. And, uh, you know, so I just was attracted to the the sheer awe of these creatures. I love dinosaurs. So it is funny to see pop culture, you know, catching up to me, uh, you know, when they invented uh, Jurassic Park and all the animation there and all that. Uh, it was a thrill. It's still a thrill. I watch every one of those movies. <laughs> you know, it's a, so I just, I grew up loving the the old black and white movies, which of course is what I'm kind of riffing on with my own films. But I also, then I grew up and I love uh, contemporary seventies movies and the grit and the, the candor and the sort of the acting style. So I really am interested in blending these two loves of my life, which is kind of naturalistic movie making with, you know, Nat Nicholson films or, or, you know, De Niro and Hoffman and all those cats from the seventies but then uh, bring this mythological element. And the other thing I'm trying to express is that the world is, it's mysterious. It's filled with uh, awe. And, you know, we try to make stories, whether it's religion or uh, whatever other kind of, you know, paths you follow to make sense of it. And so in a way, that's what the monster stories are. That's our trying to, you know, tell a mythological story of a man who turned into a wolf, you know, but you're really dealing with, issues of rage and addiction and uh and all the shit that you really deal with but it's a fun way to look at it i don't want to make a drama about an addiction that's just gonna be a sleepy time <laughs> <laughs> i gotta bring some hair put it on that dude give me some pointed ears and some fangs <laughs> when you were a kid did you used to watch like late night horror films or oh, like of course. Uh, yeah i i get that because we're around the same age i yeah. loved the late night horror. I would read the TV guide every week to just, can, can you name some of the, for me, night, 1968, night of the living dead. That movie changed my life. George Romero. Dude. Love that movie. You know what I love about what you're saying? And I have said this in the past, but so I would watch the real old movies like Frankenstein, Frankenstein, you know, the house of Frankenstein, house mm -hmm. of Dracula, all this, you know, the, the daughters of Dracula, creature from the black lagoon, them, uh, Godzilla, all of this, uh, and then one night I saw there was this movie called Night of the Living Dead. And I'm like, oh, this will be fun. And I I went, you know, I always, my parents would be asleep and I'd creep in and, uh, you know, <laughs> play the TV really low. And actually, I used to record them on cassette. Uh, I, and did to the, I did cool? too. Is that cool? core crazy. video. <laughs> right. Dude, well, I'll finish this, but I want to say uh, the, the Uber point. Anyway, so, but the thing is, it starts black and white. It all seemed like, oh, this will be fun. And then it just, got more and more oppressive and terrifying. And I always say this was my departure from my youth because that movie was still black and white and it starts with the Boris Karloff joke, they're coming to get you, Barbara. But then it just got so relentless and uh, depraved and I just loved it and was blown away. I mean, I was terrified in the best possible way. It was really cool. So that was my coming of age moment with sort of the fulcrum. And that's when I feel like I learned that there was even more uh dangerous kind of horror film and you know on it went but i think you know what's interesting is that we're both a product of actually a commercial impulse you know they sold this package of black and white movies to television when we were kids and then they realized that the kids loved it and they put on the horror host and then they realized they could sell cereal and then they realized they can sell us little toys. And I bought all the models, the Aurora models. Then I bought oh, yeah. famous monsters of film. Oh, and then you started film threat. It's right. all of a piece, dude. We're just the product of a commercial <laughs> <laughs> exchange. <laughs> I'm such a nerd. I have a book of, I have a book that's all the instruction manuals from the old Aurora model kits. And I used to build those kits when I was a kid. So I, I feel you. Um, we're yeah. living at a time in Hollywood where, a lot of the older, uh, the IP that, that Hollywood has bought, I think, honestly, I, you don't have to have an opinion about this, but I'll just say, I think Hollywood is a terrible shepherd of intellectual property when it comes yeah. to whether it's Star Trek, Star Wars, whatever. Having said that, genre films in terms of types of monsters have been around since the beginnings of Hollywood. We're looking at Dracula, 
Frankenstein, the Wolfman, classic monsters. And what's so fascinating about um, and Blackout, it's it's a Wolfman story, right? Yeah. But like also when you look at like the Wolfman has evolved so much from the original Lon Chaney to like different eras and people have kind of added to it. You know, uh, 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 John Landis with an American werewolf in London. There've been, you know, right. wolf, there's other types of, so as you began to create blackout, what did you, knowing that people know the basic rules of how um, a, a, a man wolf, wolf man story, like, like takes place. How did that inform knowing all of the past? And it's amazing to me that monster movies of certain types are still really popular. They just are. You know, oh, it's well, not tied our, to an IP, but it's a type of monster. I just, you know, yeah. getting to where you are with Blackout. Well, I agree. And also, I mean, look, my thing is that horror is per a perennial because life is mm -hmm. filled with uh, terror and random violence and uh, inexplicable things and uh, still nature, even though we aren't as engaged with it, uh, you know, the idea of a bear attack, these things still have real resonance. It's uh, whatever the reptile brain responding to the terrors of that. And uh, we gleefully want to see it depicted in some way or other. But I'd also argue that like Wolfman and also Frankenstein's monster, a lot of these stories are about, you know, loneliness, feeling like an outsider, feeling alienated. And that's the entree into a movie. Uh, and if you think about the Benicio del Toro uh, Wolfman, uh, he had father issues and he was an artist. I think, yeah, he was an actor. And he was a sad dude and felt outside of it, you know, in his town. So it's really the same uh, basic story as the other one, even though the makeup is different. So, uh, and, you know, I would argue that most werewolf movies have that sense of, uh, you know, the, the loneliness of the character. Uh, unless you're afraid of the werewolf, then it's another trope. But, you know, if you get to know the guy that's turning into the creature, then um, it's usually about being alienated and uh, losing control. Maybe it's a movie about anger. Who knows? So. Uh, that's why it's a perennial. Uh, the, these things are always relevant. And then there's sort of the thrill of how are we going to do it with our new technologies? Now we got Kong and Godzilla running around like they're in MMA <laughs> fighters or something. I, <laughs> I, I almost couldn't see that one, but, uh, yeah. but I still love watching the monsters. So um, the, uh, I, I just think it, it remains fascinating. And, you know, what I try to do is update it. There's contemporary sort of political discussion in there without getting too dreary, but uh, you know, you kind of, you're you're realizing the familiar which is our current uh issues or vibe uh, and then with this classic element you know the the wolfman dilemma the curse so uh, that's why it works i think but you're right you know what it is hollywood is afraid of horror they they could do the superheroes because that's sort of a morality play and you know guys in tights very popular with the kids uh but <laughs> then um but horror it touches a nerve and so they don't uh it's very rare. That's why we make so much of uh, the, the uh, what's it called? The cannibal movie, you know, uh, with Jodie Foster and uh, because uh, Silence of the Lambs, because it's actually a very bleak film. Uh, and it's rare that a, a major moneymaker is touching on the really the dark side. So that's why they can't. That's why they made the mummy into a, uh, you know, an action film with Tom Cruise. It just totally flopped because they were they were betraying the source material, you know? Yeah. It's I've always just, I've like you just always love monster movies. It, it, um, I, I think part of it is when a monster is sympathetic. Yeah. You know, like, uh, Boris Karloff as Frankenstein. Um, I mean that performance and, and the fact that those characters started multiple movies and even team ups uh, crazy yeah. enough. But it, it's it's the sympathetic factor. But also, I think we live in uniquely dark times today. And I think yeah. horror, it's horror at the box office is almost Teflon. It's um, yeah. seriously, when you look at the movies that, you know, last year, the term flop buster came into popularity because so <laughs> many big, you know, uh, so many big studio movies bombed and did not yeah. perform, uh, <laughs> not perform well, but horror films have always if they just they're surprising in their resilience and i really think it's us working out a lot of things that are dark in the real world i don't know why as you said like studios aren't leaning more into horror because you see you know a small 
you know, horror movie made for five, 10 million, they tend to always do well. Yeah. Well, that's the other thing is that the genre is the star and therefore they don't have to get uh, the world-class actors. Um, and so they can be made cheaper, even though, you know, cheap is a relative term, 250 right. grand versus, you know, 10 million, but 10 million <laughs> right. is a small budget in a, in a big picture uh, or a Blumhouse movie, you know, they'll, they'll spend five or 10, uh, but also the way they structure those movies, they're paying, even Ethan Hawke is just getting a minimum salary and he gets a cut of the movie and everybody knows right. it's going to do well because Blumhouse has his, his jam going. So, uh, but more to the point, the more important point is what you're saying. I mean, people need horror to express their anxieties and this world is getting more and more uh, fraught. Um, I mean, it always felt fraught, obviously, in our growing up you had nuclear war and now we have sort of climate change, which in a way seems sort of vague and gentle, but then when it strikes, uh, you know, with a bad storm or something randomly weird, it is scary. So we're living with that kind of fear. And then monsters, as you say, you know, they're the outsider and that doesn't go away. We all feel alienated and especially now more alienated. Obviously our culture's falling to pieces with the stupid fucking texting and everything or whatever yeah. it is that's gone Social wrong. Social media, I think, is Social really media is a lot in our brains. But um, there's a movie in there. I mean, I don't know that I'm the one to make it, but you'll find there's going to, well, there's a lot of, that's the theme of a lot of horror movies is sort of, you know, people, whatever, in panic rooms or whatever these movies are. But uh, yeah, there's, unfortunately, there's always a fear and a reason to be afraid. And that's something that horror provides some comfort, some catharsis. Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm, I'm just so encouraged and excited that horror as a genre seems to, I mean, when you look at, you know, who's performing well profit wise at, yeah. at theaters, at horror, I, I also probably because I go to monster Palooza and son of monster Palooza every year. Um, you've been right. Like, yeah, I love, I just, there's something about the horror community that is so supportive. Even when a horror film isn't, isn't so hot, I don't care. I just, I, I have to see, I have to see it all. So um, yeah. congratulations on this. A any final words as we have to wrap up the, the interview here? Um, no, but I just want to say Film Threat is like as classic in my life as Famous Monsters of Filmland. You know, oh. you were the guys, I have my habit reviews still from you guys, uh, very cherished. I, I love what you guys do, and, and thanks for doing it all, Chris. Uh, Larry will support everything you do. Uh, please come back and talk to us. Blackout is in uh, select theaters on April 12th. Check it out, and also on video on demand. So make sure to see it. Uh, Larry, dude, you're, uh, I just, I love your final thought. I just love your resilience. I love your passion. I love that. Like, sure. You'll do the studio gig or the, uh, whatever Hollywood movie. And you're, you're, you're not walking away to only have a Hollywood career. You're doing the indie stuff. And I'm telling you that's, um, uh, I don't know. I just really admire that. So, um, I appreciate it. Thanks for being, you know, doing this interview with us. Thanks, dude. And I just got to say, how cool is it that you would uh, record the audio cassettes of movies? I did that, too, off of TV, and I listened to them over and over. <laughs> I Okay, I before VCRs, I recorded audio exactly. cassettes of, like, episodes of the Planet of the Apes TV show. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> horror host, like, the ghoul in Michigan. Yeah. Um, I mean, just like I just recorded movies, the audio and Star Trek episodes. And the great thing about Star Trek episodes, they're like radio plays. Right. So that's they true. play really well on cassette. But yeah, I think that was definitely we were definitely nerds of a feather. Yeah, sure. exactly. And, you know, it's why I love sound design, because I used to know yes. movies like, oh, click, clop, click, clop. There's the feet. Oh, here's the door. Click, clock, click. You know, so uh, it's all part of a of a piece. <laughs> love it. Uh, Larry, thanks again. Uh, congrats on the film. Okay, man. Thanks, Chris. See ya. Take care.